Welcome, I'm Andrea Klesi for Woman's Hospital. Polycystic ovary syndrome is a big name for a fairly common disorder. Dr. Karen Elkind Hirsch explains its effects on fertility. So, polycystic ovary syndrome. One of the things I'm gonna state from the beginning is part of the reason it's called a syndrome is because we cannot agree um, upon how to make the diagnosis. Um, it's not a disease and that's one of the, the things that, that that's, makes it very difficult because um, they're really, um, despite years and years of trying to come up with a consensus on how, who has polycystic ovary syndrome, one of the problems is, is that this disease is incredibly heterogeneous. And so people may present with only parts of it, some of it, um, and perhaps we probably need to come up with a, another name for it. Because one of the things is that um, polycystic ovary syndrome was actually first described in 1935 by, um, it used to be called Stein Leventhal, and that's um, because Dr. Stein and Leventhal were the first ones to describe it. And what they found is they were um, doing surgery in women and found that there was this group of women who had a combination of being obese, of having like um, facial hair, okay, and, and, and sort of a masculinization. But also when they looked at their ovaries, they had this bunch of cysts on them, it looked like cysts. And really what they turned out to be were not really cysts, but follicles that had not been released because one of the things these women complained about was their cycles were not normal. So um, that is where the original description came from. And of course, until about 1980, um, polycystic ovary syndrome was considered a reproductive disorder because the women had, uh, they didn't cycle normally, so they had infertility, so they didn't have normal periods. Um, they had elevated male hormones, which in many of them presented with facial and body hair, like a man. Um, and not all of them, but a large proponent of them had, had obesity or were overweight, or more, more importantly, had kind of that weight in the middle, um, even if they weren't overweight, sort of had that sort of masculine body habitus, as we call it. But it wasn't until 1980 that people began to realize that along with that was this group of women, um, as they began in their 40s and 50s, you know, and this was a while ago, um, had a high incidence of type 2 diabetes. Okay, so that was one of the first recognitions. And so then they began to look at how does insulin fit into this whole picture of this disease? Like, how, are these even connected? And some elegant work that was done, um, actually in Boston, by Ken McNatty, where he actually showed that that insulin in this group of women who have polycystic ovary syndrome could actually stimulate the ovary to make male hormone. That was very new. Insulin, normally LH is a hormone that makes your ovary make male hormone, it's normal. In these women, they used to have elevated LH levels, so there would be this imbalance in the brains from the, hor from the uh, hormones from the brain that make testosterone, and that's where they thought it was. But it turned out that actually insulin, if you added insulin to the, to the sort of the ovary, it synergized and even made it worse. So it was realizing that somehow insulin was tied into this whole disease. And so we began saying, okay, how does this all fit? And it turned out that, that in fact, PCOS was in fact actually a metabolic disorder that also had a component in which it now impacted the reproductive system. So, and not everybody who has insulin resistance has PCOS, but we believe that the majority of PCOS women have some type of insulin resistance. Even if they're thin, it may just be at the level of the ovary. And what it's interesting is, is that while at the level of metabolizing sugar, insulin doesn't work very well in these patients, it actually, at the level of the ovary, makes them make more androgen which is kind of, it's, it's kind of, and it has to do with, with um, the cascade of how insulin works, but it has many actions. And so um, they kind of have a defect in metabolizing sugar, but it works really well at other organ levels. 
So that was kind of how the two of them came together. We now understand that, in fact, these women have insulin resistance. If we get them pregnant, they're at very high risk for gestational diabetes, and in addition, are at very high risk for type 2 diabetes. So who's at risk for polycystic ovary syndrome? And really, um, family history is probably your biggest, your biggest variable. So um, if mom had it, or if dad's mom had it, because there really isn't a male equivalent of polycystic ovary syndrome, but dad can carry the genes, um, and he may just be insulin resistant or have diabetes, that may be another thing, but usually he has a sister or an aunt or somebody who had, in the past, who had an infertility problem, it's kind of how we identify it. You're at an extremely high risk for inheriting the disease. And even sons inherit it, it just doesn't show up because Having more testosterone in a male just is not something that is really recognizable because um, the, the, the levels are so variable in all men. One of the things that's been looked at as a, a marker in men is actually early balding um, because we know high testosterone can lead to early balding, but balding before the age of 30 is supposed to be a marker for male PCOS. But some of them, again, are at risk for diabetes and that, that may be another way it shows up. Um, but that's pretty much really, we, we haven't necessarily targeted particular um, racial groups, um, African Americans slightly higher than Caucasian, Hispanics are slightly higher. It's somewhat related to the diabetes gene, so simil some similarity. Um, so again, that's, that's pretty much where the, the connection is. So the, the biggest question and part of the reason we don't even have a handle on polycystic ovary syndrome, as I called it, um, is because how do we treat it? And the thing is, it all depends on why that patient shows up in your office. For example, um, one thing we do know is, is that it, while we know it exists prepubertally, we don't really start seeing it until a female becomes pubescent or starts having cycles because one of the things with these women is is that their cycles aren't normal. So if you take a young girl and she starts her cycle, uh, probably 80% of young girls start their cycle normally within, you know, they'll have fairly regular cycles within the first year of life. Um, some it may take two years, some it may take as many as three. But if after three years you're not cycling normally, that's something's wrong. But nowadays, because we're so aware of the genetic component, that we don't wait that long if somebody's mom, let's say, had polycystic ovary syndrome. If that child goes through puberty and her cycles aren't normal within a year, we're probably looking at her right away. Um, the insulin resistance, the whole insulin component, actually occurs even before the cycles begin. So you might start testing these people, these young girls, even before they hit puberty. Um, so that's, that's another, another variable in there. So the question is, is how do we treat this? So what happened before is it's all the reason that patient walked in your office. So for many, they're going into the dermatologist's office because they've got facial hair and that's what's disturbing them. They don't really care that the periods aren't normal. You know, that's just not important when you're a young girl. What you're more concerned about is the hair on your face and the sort of masculine body habitus. That, that may be the person they see. Some may be seeing their pediatrician. Um, some are going to an endocrinologist because they're, they, they've got the more, maybe a severer form where they've already got some of the metabolic components where they've got elevated sugars you know, after they eat, and so they might be treated for that component. Um, and then, of course, the, the biggest reason they're going to the gynecologist is because their cycles aren't normal. So, and they want to get pregnant, so they're, you know, that's a more important variable. So the treatment sometimes is tailored to why is that patient coming to see me and where are they in the realm of the lifespan, um, their lifespan. Are they young, are they old, or, you know, are they menopausal, or are they premenopausal, or all those kind of variables. So it's, it's amazing the type of treatments. Again, it is a syndrome, it is not a disease, and there is absolutely no drug approved for the treatment of polycystic ovary syndrome, including a birth control pill just to normalize their cycles. We can't even use that. We can use it as a cycle regulator, but not for polycystic ovary syndrome or to prevent pregnancy. And we do know though, you know, we know it is the most common reproductive disorder. 
We believe that the incidence is probably, you used to say about eight to 10% of reproductive age women. With our obesity epidemic, um, again, obesity exacerbates the disorder. So people who may not have shown some of the symptoms because their insulins weren't high, now are showing it because they've got the obesity or they're showing it earlier. So um, we believe now you're seeing it maybe in 20%. And there are certain populations that have even higher percentages of it. One of the things is if you don't cycle normally, it is gonna make it much more difficult for you to conceive. Because even in women who are cycling on a normal basis, we always say, you know, you're not infertile unless you've been trying actively, you know, for a year. Um, and that's assuming that you're having a cycle every month. Well, you know, what if you're having one every year, or two a year, or three a year, and you don't even know when they're gonna happen, it's, it's very, very difficult. It is a very treatable disorder in terms of fertility. It's probably the most treatable. Um, but on the other hand, one of the nice things is patients recognize it early. Um, you recognize your cycles aren't, you know you have a problem at 20 when your cycles aren't normal. You're not waiting till you're 40. So we are catching these women at a much younger age. But many times they do need some, some um, help with conceiving. So lifestyle is an important variable. So, you know, eating, eating foods that are, that are low in sugar, um, exercising, even for, for many of these patients, will, you know, is, is a very important part of their lifestyle. There are lots of medications to help control some of the stuff that may make them uncomfortable. And that may be simply, you know, the hair on their face, um, some of the, the the unfeminine body habitus. Um, so those are things that are treatable, but it's just getting to the root of where they are. Um, and in many cases, it's if you can fix the whole insulin and glucose, you actually can fix the androgens as well. But you know, there are lots of ways we can fix along the way. It's just doing simple topical removal of hair becomes very frustrating because as long as the male hormone's around, it's gonna find another follicle to stimulate and make that hair become dark and unattractive. So again, you know, figure out why, you're, why you have that hair and then treat it and then you can get it removed and it will be permanent. So that's, you know, one of the things. That, and I have to say dermatologists are one of our greatest source of recognizing this patient population because they know if they, they treat these women even with laser, the hair comes back, they know that there's gotta be an underlying reason why it's coming back. So they really are very good at recognizing that and um, bringing it to the attention of the gynecologists and endocrinologists. For more information, visit womans.org. Womans, exceptional care centered on you.